Okay guys, this is uh, part two of the test for module five uh, uh, retake. So this is what you guys need to watch in order to take the test um, again. So make sure you guys watch part one and also this one which is part two. All right, let's get started. I already did one through eight in part one, so we're gonna start with number nine. Okay, so number nine says, uh, for six points it says, find the x-intercepts of p of x equals x times the quantity x plus five times the quantity x plus three times the quantity x minus two squared. So <clears throat> that's only part A. There's gonna be multiple parts to this problem, obviously. So let's start with part A. Find the x-intercepts. The x-intercepts are each gonna come from each factor of your polynomial, right? This is the polynomial uh, function. Each one of these is called a factor. Each factor will give you an x-intercept. So, for example, the very first one is x. Set each factor equal to 0, and by this time, you guys are all familiar with doing that in your head. Set each factor equal to 0, and that gives you what the x-intercept is. So, the first one, for example, is x equals 0, and that's it. x equals 0 is your first x-intercept. The x-intercepts are also known as zeros or roots. Okay, so we call them zeros, we call them roots, we call them x-intercepts. We call them solutions when it's an equation that we need to solve. But it's the same thing, the same concept. So x equals 0 is the first one. The next one, x plus 5. What x-intercept will that give me? It'll give me x equals negative 5. x plus 3 will give you x equals negative 3. And x minus 2 will give you x equals positive 2. Now, this one is squared, but that doesn't matter. It still gives you the exact same x-intercept, right? It's, it really means x minus 2 times x minus 2, so it'll give you x equals 2 twice. You don't have to write it twice. It's just x equals 2, and that's it. Okay, so for part B, it says describe the end behavior of this function and justify your answer algebraically. So the end behavior will come from uh, multiplying the first term of each of the factors. Okay, I suggest you guys go back and watch problem number one where I explain everything about n behavior and how we can determine it. But in this one, if I multiply x times x times x times x squared, I get x to the fifth, right? So that is what's going to determine my n behavior, x to the fifth. What you look at for the n behavior is the leading coefficient, which if it's x to the fifth, that means it's 1x to the fifth. So it's really 1x to the fifth. And that's what's going to determine your end behavior. Your leading coefficient, check if it's positive or negative. Your uh, exponent, check if it's odd or even. So this is positive, which means that my end behavior at the very end on the right, remember I, I'll go back and look at problem number one again just so you guys can see clearly what, I, what I'm talking about. If this first number is positive, it talks about the right side of the graph. The right side is going up. So I know that on the right, it's going up because it's positive. The second, the, the n value, which is the degree here, the exponent, tells you if the, the two sides are going to be exactly the same or they're going to be opposites of each other. If this is even, that means they're the same. If this is odd, they're opposites of each other. In this case, since it's odd, that means they're opposites of each other, which means that the left side goes down. That's your end behavior. We don't write it like that, though. We're going to write it algebraically what that means. So, on the left side, it's going down. We say, as x approaches negative infinity, that means left. Look, x goes to the left. What's happening to y on the left? It's going down. Then you say, y, or f of x. Nope, it's not f of x, though. Let's erase that. All right? If we're careful, I wouldn't take half points if you guys wrote f of x. I'm just saying, to be to be correct, it's p of x, not f of x in this case. p of x approaches negative infinity. What does that mean? On the left, it's going down. Now let's talk about the right. you got to write a second one for the right side. As x approaches positive infinity, that means right, y, p of x, is going up, approaches positive infinity as well. There you go. There's your end behavior. Part C. Determine whether each x-intercept is of odd or even multiplicity. Multiplicity means how, how many times does that x-intercept uh, occur in your function. For example, if you look here at the function, x is to the 1 power. That means x equals 0 is a 0 only once. 
x plus 5 is to the 1 power. That means x equals negative 5 is a, uh, an x-intercept only once. x plus 3 to the 1 power. That means x equals negative 3 is an x-intercept only once. But the last one, x equals 2, that means x minus 2 to the second power. That means that this one happens twice. It has tw uh, two multiplicity. The multiplicity of this one is 2, which makes it um, even multiplicity. Okay, so basically you're just looking at the power of each original factor to determine the multiplicity. But you have to write each one. So you're going to say x equals 0. That's odd. Because it only happens once. x equals negative 5. That's also odd. Because it only happens once. Right? You're looking at the power up here of the factor x equals negative 3, also odd, and finally x equals 2, that one is even. Not because the number is even, but because its power of the original factor is even. So there you go, that explains the multiplicity. What we mean by multiplicity is how many times does each uh, x-intercept or each zero happen. All right, let's move on to part D, graphing the function. Here we go. Okay, to graph the function, what you need to start with is to find the x-intercepts on the x-axis, obviously. So on the x-axis, go ahead and point out your x-intercepts, which are 0, right here, uh, negative 5, the ones we found from uh, part A, negative 5, negative 3, right here, and positive 2. Those are probably the, those are the most important points of your graph. You have to touch those points. And you may not touch the x-intercept anywhere else except for those four points. The next thing that I'm going to do in order to determine the end behavior is, I mean, the, the graph is to look at the end behavior. So we already said that the end behavior is down on the left, up on the right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw two guiding arrows just for me, one going down on the left, one going up on the right. Notice where I drew them very specifically. I drew them near this point for the left one because I know it's, I have to get to that point. And this one I drew near the last one over here because I know I have to get through that point also. Okay, uh, I might be a little bit off of where they actually are, but I know that it's close to this point and close to this point. It's going down on this side. It's going up on that side. All right. The next thing you do is to look at the multiplicity. The multiplicity tells you if the graph is going to cross at that point or be tangent at that point. The basic idea is that even is tangent, odd crosses, E-T-O-C. If the multiplicity is even, it's going to be tangent. If the multiplicity is odd, it's going to cross. And remember, multiplicity, what I mean is basically the power of each factor, right? So for negative 5 is the first one that we're going to encounter. Because I'm, I'm, I'm starting to draw my graph this way. Negative 5 is the first one that we encountered. If I look up here at C, that's odd. That means that it's going to cross. So I'm going to cross right through negative 5. Like that. Doesn't matter how high you go, but you have to come back down and hit the 3. The negative 3. You have to come back down. Okay? You can't just keep going that way and skip it. You have to come and hit the negative 3 at some point. And you may not cross before that either. You have to cross right through there. Or touch right there. Again, I'm going to check the multiplicity before I actually touch it. Check negative 3, which is this one. The multiplicity is once again odd, so I'm going to cross through. Crossing. And again, it doesn't matter how low you go, you have to come back up and hit the 0. Now for 0, which is this one, that means odd. That means also going to cross. So I'm going to cross right through that one also. Cross through. Come back down and hit the 2. You have to come back and hit the 2. And finally, for the 2, I check the multiplicity again. It's even. That means that it's going to be tangent at that point. And that's it. And that is the sketch of your graph. Is it perfect? No, it's not. For all we know, this could go all the way up here and then come down. This one could go all the way down here and then come down. Or it could be like really, really close and come down really fast. Okay, We don't know that, but we know that this matches the basic sketch of the graph. It tells us the important things like how many turning points there are, uh, how many hills, and how many valleys there are, which is the next question. 
Okay, so part E, determine the number of turning points on the graph. Turning point is any time that the graph changes direction, either from going up to coming down or from going down to coming up. Okay, so for example, I see a turning point right away right here. The graph is going up and it comes back down. I see another one right here. The graph is coming down and it comes back up. And another one here. So every little hill, every little valley is a turning point. Okay, every bump, every dip is a turning point. So there's one, two, three, four turning points. Of course, if you graph the graph incorrectly, some, somehow you made a, a mistake there, then that means that you probably got this part wrong as well. Okay, you got to make sure you have the, right, the graph correctly so that you can get this correctly. All right, in part F, it says determine the number of local maxima, local minima, global maximum, and global minimum. Okay, so we're going to find the maximums and minimums for this graph. Local maximum, one, two. Any time you see a bump, every time you see a hill, that is considered a local maximum. So there's two of those. One, two. Two local maximums. Oops. Two local maxima. Minimums. You look at the uh, valleys, not the hills, but the valleys. Every time you see a little dip in the graph like this one, this is a minimum. But that's not the only one, and some of you guys got this question wrong because you only counted that one. This one right here, even though it doesn't go below the x-axis, it doesn't have to. It's still a valley, right? It's still a point where the graph was going down and then it came back up. This one and this one are both local minima. Two local minima. And globals, globals are easy, guys. Just look at the arrows. If it's going to the left, uh, on the left side is going down forever. Since it's going down forever on the left side right there, that means that there's a global minimum which is going to be negative infinity. Same thing on the right side, look at the arrow going all the way up. If it's going up forever, there's a, a global maximum which is positive infinity. So there's one global minimum and one global maximum. One global max and one global min for minimum. And there you go. That completes part F of the problem. Okay, let's move on to number 10. It says graph using transformations. G of x equals negative 2 times the quantity x plus 2 cubed minus 1. So <clears throat> this uh, number 10 and number 11 and I think number 12 also are the uh, same idea. You're graphing using transformations. Um, by this point, you guys are very, very familiar with transformations. The main mistake that I saw in this problem was that people were using the uh, the wrong um, starting table. Okay, so you gotta make sure you remember your tables to see which one you're supposed to be using. We're graphing a cubic function here, which means that my table that I'm gonna start with looks like this. Cubic function. Your x values are negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. Your y values are negative eight negative 1, 0, 1, 8. Cubic function means you're cubing the number, so it should be getting bigger. Negative 2 becomes negative 8. 2 becomes positive 8. It should not be uh, becoming smaller, which is what a lot of you guys did. You flip these numbers around, and that is not a cubic function. That is a cube root function. Okay, so knowing that that is our correct table, all we got to do now is just find our parameters B, H, A, and K. I don't see B, but I'm going to draw them all. I'm going to write them all anyway. B, H, A, Okay, B is not there, which means it's 1. If B or A are not there, you can't see them, that means they're 1. Um, H is H is in here, the parentheses with X. It's a, it says plus 2, but that means that H is negative 2. A, A is in front of the parentheses. That's negative 2. Negative 2. And k is at the very end, which is negative 1. There you go. Those are your four parameters. So we got to remember what to do with them. At this point, you're all very familiar with that. You're going to multiply the x values. For the x values, you're going to multiply times b, then add h. For the y values, you're going to multiply times a, then oops, you're going to multiply times a, then add k. 
when these k's are both negative, so you're actually going to subtract that number. But that's ba the basic idea, okay? You're going to, for the x values, times b plus h. For the y values, times a plus k. So here we go. Let's transform our function into something new. Let's start with the x values. It says that I'm supposed to multiply times 1 and then subtract 2. Multiplying times 1 is pointless. When you multiply times 1, it doesn't do anything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cross out this b equals 1 because it's not necessary for my graph. right? All I need to do is just subtract 2 then. So negative 2 minus 2, you get negative 4. Do the same thing for the next one. Negative 1 minus 2, you get negative 3. The next one. 0 minus 2 is negative 2. 1 minus 2 is negative 1. And finally, 2 minus 2 is 0. There you go. Those are your x values. Now let's work on the y values. Um, for the y values, it says here, according to my parameters, multiply first times negative 2, then subtract 1. So times negative 2 plus 1. Make sure you guys are being careful, especially since both of these numbers are negatives and some of these are negatives. It's very easy to make a mistake. Be careful when you're doing the calculation. So first, negative 8 times negative 2 is 16. Positive 16, right? Negative 8 times negative 2 is positive 16. Minus 1 is 15. Positive 15. There you go. Next, negative 1 times negative 2 is positive 2. Minus 1 is 1. The next one is 1. Next, negative, uh, no, 0. 0 times negative 2 is 0. Minus 1 is negative 1. There we go. Next is 1. 1 times negative 2 is negative 2. Minus 1 is negative 3. And finally, 8. 8 times negative 2 is negative 16, minus 1 is negative 17. Those are your values. All you got to do now at this point is plot those points on your graph as much as you can. Obviously, negative 4, 15 and 0, negative 17 are not going to fit in the space that I gave you guys for your graph. But you could graph the other ones and you could have a basic idea of what the shape is supposed to look like. So here we go. Let's plot those points. Uh, negative 3, 1. Negative 3, 1 is going to be here. Negative 2, negative 1. Negative 2, negative 1 is going to be right here. And negative 1, negative 3 is going to be right here. Those are the only three that I can plot. I do have an idea, however, of where the other ones are. Negative 4, 15 is way up here. And, neg and 0, negative 17 is way down, right, way below where, where I can see my graph. So since it's way down there, that means that my graph goes like this. A lot of you guys drew a graph that looked like that. And it's, does not. this graph does not become flat on its ends. It actually becomes almost vertical on its ends. So it look, goes in this direction like this. Down, hit that point, hit that one, and then down again. Like that. That's what it's supposed to look like. Some of you guys drew a graph that you hit those points, but it looks like this. And that would be incorrect. Okay, that it is these graphs, cubic graphs, cubic functions do not flatten out on their ends. So that would be incorrect. It's the red one right there. That is the correct one. And that's it. Okay, let's move on to number eleven, which is the same as number ten. It's still a cubic function, uh, but in this case, it looks like we have b instead of a. But the steps are the same. So once again, we're going to start by finding b, h, a, and k. So here we go. Uh, b, h, a, and k. Now if you look at it carefully, you notice that there's a fraction inside of the parentheses where the cube is. So that's b. b is determined by that number. That's not a. If there was an a, it would be outside, over here, outside the parentheses, completely outside the parentheses. So that's b, but it's not one-third. Remember, for b, you always do the reciprocal. So b is 3. The reciprocal of one-third is 3. h is, as always, inside with the x, either being added or subtracted. It says x plus 2. That means h is negative 2. 
A, there is no A in this case, right? Like we said, that's B, A would be outside. If there is no A there, that means A equals 1. And K is negative 1. Right? K is always there at the end. Like before, you start your table. And make sure you guys remember your tables. This one is a cubic function once again, just like number 10. So your numbers should be negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. And your y values are the cube of that, negative 8, negative 1, 0, 1, and 8. And now let's transform it. This table transforms into something completely new. Here we go. So <clears throat> according to my parameters here, I am supposed to, for the x values, first multiply times 3, then subtract 2, okay? Keep repeating this, make sure you guys re uh, realize these two are for the x values, these two are for the y values. Multiply times 3, subtract 2. So first, negative 2 times 3, negative 6, minus 2, negative 8. All right, let me repeat that again. Negative 2 times 3, negative 6, minus 2, negative 8. Okay, keep going. Negative 1 times 3 is negative 3. Minus 2 is negative 5. Next, 0. 0 times 3 is 0. Minus 2 is negative 2. Next is 2. 2 times 3 is 6. Minus 2 is 4. Whoops, I, I skipped the 1, huh? Didn't I? Let's do 1 first. 1 times 3 is 3. Minus 2 is 1. And finally, 2. 2, 2 times 3 is 6, minus 2 is 4. All right, let's continue with the y values. So my y values are right here. According to this par these parameters, I multiply times 1, then subtract 1. As before, since you're multiplying times 1, that doesn't do anything, so we can just skip that. Basically, just subtract 1 to all the y values. So when I subtract 1, that should be pretty simple. I'm going to get negative 9, right? negative 8 minus 1. Negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2. 0 minus 1 is negative 1. And 1 minus 1 is 0. And the last one, 8 minus 1 is 7. There's your values. Now all you have left to do is to graph those points, plot those points in your graph, and you're done. So negative 8, negative 9, it doesn't really fit but uh, we have enough space that we can actually make it fit so negative 8 negative 9 down here okay. so negative 8 negative 9 I'm approximating that it will be right about there negative 5 negative 2 negative 5 negative 2 right here negative 2 negative 1 right there 1 0 right there and 4 7 There you go. And now what you got to do is just graph, uh, connect those points to make to make your graph. So here we go. I'm going to connect them this way and then around like this and then up like that. And just like the last one, this one does not end flat. Okay. So do not draw a graph that for some reason ends is flat on one end like this and then like that, right? It wouldn't look like that. It's a cubic function, which means that it's going to increase and decrease forever on both ends like that. Okay, number 12, find the inverse of the function and then verify using composition. So we have f of x equals 2 over 3x plus 5. Let's find the inverse. First step is change f of x to y. So y equals 2 over 3 x plus 5. Your goal is to isolate the x, so the first thing you got to get rid of is this 5. So we're going to subtract 5 on both sides. Minus 5. I'm going to get y minus 5 on the left and 2 thirds x on the right. Next, you got to get rid of the 2 thirds. Some of you guys chose to get rid of both the 2 and the 3 at the same time by multiplying by the reciprocal, which is 3 halves. That's an option. Um, most of you guys chose to get rid of one number at a time, so let's do go that way. We're going to multiply both sides times 3, times 3 on this side as well. 
And the reason for that is because this 3 will cancel the denominator 3. They cancel each other out. And it will leave me with just 2x. So it's just 2x on this side. On the left side, though, it's y minus 5 times 3. And this is one of the most common mistakes. People wrote 3y minus 5 when it's really 3y minus 15. Like that. And then finally, get rid of the 2 by dividing by it. So I'm going to divide by 2 right there. Divide everything by 2 and I'm going to continue over here so what I get is 3y minus 15 over 2 equals x I'm going to flip that around and write x equals 3y minus 15 over 2 now the sec the last two steps is to change the x to y and the y to x and then change the y to f inverse and you're done so it's going to be y equals 3x minus 15 over 2. And finally, y is f inverse. Fix that. f inverse equals 3x minus 15 over 2. There you go. That is your inverse. That was one point for doing that correctly. The second point came from doing the composition. It says verify using composition. So we're going to do composition with the original and the inverse. It doesn't matter which one you plug into which one, you should get the same answer. Okay? I'm going to go ahead and do, let me see, I'm going to plug in the inverse into the original. Like that. Right? That means the inverse inside of the original. So here we go. The original is <clears throat> f of uh, f inverse equals, here we go, 2 over 3, x plus 5. But instead of x, what I'm going to plug in there is my inverse, which we just found out is 3x minus 15 over 2. And I'm going to simplify that. What happens at this point is that the 2 in the numerator here and the 2 in the denominator cancel each other out. So what you have is f of f inverse equals 3x minus 15 over 3 plus 5. Keep simplifying. 3x over 15 over minus 15 over 3 means 3x over 3 minus 15 over 3 plus 5. 3 over 3 cancels, leaving you with just x. 15 over 3 is 5, so it's x minus 5 plus 5. The negative 5 and the positive 5 cancel, leaving you with just x, and that's what you're supposed to get. In a composition, you should end up with just x, and that proves that these are inverses of each other. Okay, number 13 says, write the inverse relation as ordered pairs. Is the inverse relation a function? Why or why not? I think most of you guys got this one correct. So let's see. Inverse relation means that the x's and the y's are reversed, right? So that's exactly what you need to do. I'm going to make a table where I'm going to reverse all the x's and the y's, all the inputs and the outputs. So it's 5, negative 3. 5, 2. 6, 1. 7, 4, and negative 3, 3, 8. There you go. Now the second question is, is the inverse, is this one, a function y or y not? So what you do is you look at the inverse, look at the x values. Each one of them should be unique, right? And they're not. Look at the 5s. 5 goes to negative 3, and 5 again goes to 2. So the same input goes to two different outputs. This is not a function. Each input should go to the to one output only. In this case, the 5 goes to two different outputs. Why not? It says, why or why not? Explain why not. You could have told me, because it is 1 to many. One input, the 5, goes to many outputs, negative 3 and 2. You could have said that. Or I also accept it if you guys just told me which one in particular. So somebody said, um, the input 5... The input 5 has two different outputs. Um, negative 3 and 2. 
And that's enough to tell me that you understand that the one input cannot have two outputs, okay? So some of you guys said one to many, some of you guys said this, that's correct, either way is correct. Some of you guys said many to one and then you still said not a function, that doesn't make sense. If it is a function, I mean if it's not a function, it has to be one to many, okay? Many to one is a function. This one is many to one. Two points go to the same number, so that's many to one. So that's what I expected from this one. Okay, 14. Determine whether the graph is odd, even, or neither. Explain how you know. If they give you a function and they want you to figure out is it odd, even, or neither, what you need to do is plug in the negative x um, in each one of the x's to see what you get. If you get the exact same thing back, let's say I plug in negative x and I get this. 5x to the 4th plus x cubed minus 1, which is exactly the same then that would be considered even. Let's say I plug in negative x, but instead I get this, negative 5x to the 4th minus x cubed plus 1, that would be considered odd, because notice how everything changed signs, right? The exact opposite of what you started with is odd. The exact same thing that you started with is even. If I don't get either one of those, then it's neither. So let's do the work. Let's see. I'm going to plug in negative x. Every time that I see an x, I'm going to plug in negative x. So f of negative x equals 5. x to the fourth plus x cubed minus 1. Plug in negative x right there and right there. Let's simplify it. f of negative x equals... Now, when you simplify this, think about it. Negative x to the fourth power. Do not multiply 5 times negative x, right? Power first. Negative x to the fourth power. That means negative times negative times negative times negative is going to turn positive. So it's just x to the fourth times 5. It's 5x to the fourth. For the next one, negative x to the third power. That's negative times negative times negative. This is going to be negative at the end. So what you're going to write is negative x cubed. And the negative 1 does not change, right? Because there's no x to change it, so it's just negative 1. Negative 1. Now compare what you got to the original, and you should be able to see the 5, the first term, it stayed the same. The second term changed. The last term stayed the same. Okay. In order for it to be even, all of them have to stay the same. That's not true happening here. In order for it to be odd, all of them have to change. That's not true here either. This one is neither. It's not even or odd because it did not give me the exact same thing back. It did not give me the exact opposite back. The explaining how you know part, right here, explain how you know. You could say in words or write this, which is what I wrote right here. If it was this, it would be even. If it was this, it would be odd. And so that tells me that you know exactly how you got neither. If you had gotten this, it would have been even. If you had gotten this, it would have been odd. Okay, the last one. An x by x square is cut from each corner of a rectangular sheet of cardboard that is 5.5 inches long by 4.5 inches wide. The sides are then folded up to form a box. To the nearest tenth, what value of x maximizes the volume of the box? What is the maximum vo volume of the box? Okay, so here's what you're doing. You have an, uh, uh, a, a rectangular sheet of cardboard. Let's draw that. And you're cutting off a corner. And the measures of that corner are x by x. It's x here, x here. x, 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 x x x that's what they mean by an x by x square right each side of that little box corner that we're cutting off is x the cardboard itself is 5.5 .5 inches long and 4.5 inches wide the sides are then folded up to form a box so you got a picture how we were folding up those sides to make a box to the nearest tenth what value of x maximizes we're looking for the volume of the box. What is the maximum volume of the box? First thing, since they're asking about volume, I need to remember what the formula for the volume of a box of a rectangular prism is. And that is V equals length times width times height. Right? Length times width times height. So what we got to do is figure out what the length, the width, and the height are going to be in my final box. 
So let's start with length. If I look at it, this is the length of the cardboard before we cut off the, the sides. It's 5.5. But since we're cutting off x from one side and x from the other side, the final length is going to be 5.5 minus 2x. For the width, same idea. The original width is 4.5, but we're cutting off x from one side and x from the other side. We're cutting off 2x, so it's 4.5 minus 2x. And for the height, this is the one where a lot of people had trouble picturing it. Remember, you're picturing that you're folding this up into a box. The final box, after you cut off those boxes and you fold them up, you're basically folding along this line right here, along this line right here, like that, like that. Imagine using those as a folding. What's going to be the final height of the box? The final height is going to be x, just x, because that's what you cut off from each side. Okay, so using those and my formula for volume, here's my formula for volume, means that my volume of my box is going to be this one times this one times this one. So this is your final formula for your volume. V equals... I'm going to write the x first. It's always nicer to write the uh, the single term by itself at the uh, at the beginning. Times 5.5 minus 2x times 4.5 minus 2x. There you go. And at this point, what you're going to do is you're going to plunge that into a calculator and find the maximum. We're looking for the maximum. So you're looking at your calculator. So let's say... I graph it and it looks something like this I don't know exactly what it looks like what you want to look for is for this point right here the maximum point of your of your graph the, the highest point on your graph uh, not positive infinity though right within the range that we're looking at so <clears throat> that's what I'm gonna do right now I'm gonna go ahead and graph that and see what I get Okay, so here's what I did. I went ahead and graphed the function in uh, decimals. You could do the same thing on a graphing calculator when you're at school taking the test. So I punched in the, the volume formula right here, x times 5.5 minus 2x times 4.5 minus 2x. And it gave me this graph right here. And like I said, what we care about is the maximum point, this one right here. We don't care about the maximum up there. That's positive infinity. That wouldn't make sense according to this uh, situation, right? It wouldn't make sense to say, I'm going to cut off positive infinity from each side. So this is the point that you care about. I, I, I clicked on it on decimals, and it gave me that. On your graphing calculator, you could find it by tracing the graph until you get to the highest possible point right there. According to decimals, it gives me that. That means that x is 8.21. And y, but it's not y here, it's v, it's volume, is 9.052. So that's what I'm going to write. x equals 0 0.821 inches. And the volume when x is 0 0.821 is 9.052 cubic inches. Approximately, right? These are approximations because of the calculator. If I zoom in closer, it's going to give me a closer approximation. On your graphing calculators, if, you, if you're not zoomed in that much, you're going to get a, a, a not a, as close as this one. Right? You might get 0.8 and 9 exactly for the volume. Okay, But that is the basic idea. That answers both of the questions. The questions were uh, to the nearest tenth. Oh, to the nearest tenth. I need to fix that then. To the nearest tenth, x equals 0 0.8. And V is 9.1. There you go. Inches, inches cubed. Yeah, volume is always cubed. This is the correct answer right here. The one in red circled by yellow. Uh, because it says to the nearest tenth. But again, I answered both questions. To the nearest tenth, what value of X maximizes the volume of the box? That one. What is the maximum volume of the box? That one right there. And you're done. All right, so this, that concludes this review video. Make sure you guys watch both part one and part two to get ready for the retake on Tuesday. Okay, the retake will be on Tuesday, so make sure you guys watch both. Uh, comment on either one so you guys can have, have proof that you actually did watch them uh, to prepare for the, for the test. Okay, see you guys on Monday.